Hello, uh, on today's show, I'm joined by the one and only It's Bushwhacker Luke. How are you doing? Bloody lovely to your mother. It's <laughs> great to be on the entertainment show, mate. Oh, the right. entertainment fix, whatever. Anyhow, mate, and all my viewers in the UK and around the world. Well, I was going to say, have you got a lot of happy memories from your, your wrestling days in the UK that you, you can remember? Yes, sir. I have a lot, mate. You, being a British subject, you know, it reminded me back of New Zealand back in the day. What's the that? Pubs, the pubs on all the corners, you know, <laughs> it's like in the States, you know, you have a crossroad and there's three or four pubs, you know, with a crossroad, uh, the three, of the three of the four corners have got pubs. That's how it was in New Zealand. That's what it's like, <laughs> or definitely what it's still like here. Um, I wanted to go back to the very beginning uh, for you, which is where your love uh, and passion for wrestling actually uh, came from. Well, I didn't have a passion. I didn't even know what it was. Never seen it. When I, when I started, yeah, well, the story is my next door neighbor was a bodybuilder. And he was in Mr. New Zealand show and he was placed second. And, and one of the judges was a former Mr. New Zealand. That's not, of 1950. I'm talking around, I'm talking now in 1961. And um, he said to my neighbor, he says, I was, do you want to make some money with that body of yours? And, and my neighbor said, well, you know, how? And, and then he introduced himself. He was the New Zealand wrestling promoter at the time. He went from bodybuilding to wrestling and became the, the pro, uh, promoter in New Zealand. So that's how my neighbor started going into the gym and that. And then six months down the line, he took me with him. I was, I was around about 160 pounds then. This is 1961. And, and then he took me in and that. And, were, and the gym was like the first Rocky movies, the gym in the first Rocky movie. Steam pipes, rattling, there was a steam room in the back, there was two rings, boxing rings, about a, a foot off the floor, the, the floor of the rings were as hard as the floor in your, in your house, and, um, and there were four ropes, instead of three ropes today, and there was no, mach no machines, there was kettlebells lying around the floor, there was no racks for weights, so just, the things were laying around the floor, there was two, there was two racks. There was a squat rack and a bench press rack. There was no m machines like there is today. And that was the old gym. I started going in with them and that and um, playing around on the mat. And, and that's how I started learning what it was, you know, the business. But I was skinny and that. And um, I don't know my height then. I can't remember, whatever. But uh, that was it. And my second wrestling show I went to, a guy never arrived, and that so they, they this was in this was in 1962, I guess in the middle of 1962, the summertime. A guy, yeah, one of the opponents in the early matches didn't arrive. First match, so they threw a pair uh, a pair of boots to me and a tank top. I had jeans on, and I, next minute I was in the ring. Now. Mate, I don't even remember what happened in the match. <laughs> I was bl I was blank, but that was my introduction to pro wrestling, and the house was sold out. It was in a town about a hundred miles north of the capital. It was called um, Palmerston North. I remember that. And that's it. And as I say, another big part of, of your wrestling career, which I'd love to talk to you about, is your time in Stampede Wrestling. Um, so how did that actually all come about for you? And what was it like uh, working for, for um, Stu Hart? What was he like as a person? Oh, uh, well, the, the introduction wasn't the best, but when we got to know him, it was great. You know, my first port of call in North America was Montreal. We were brought in by the Vachons, Butcher Vachon and Morris Vachon, Mad Dog Vachon. You remember those two guys? Yeah, no, no of them, yeah. Yeah, they were AWA guys, and and Butcher got married in the ring in WWF. He had midgets. He had a midget as the best man, I think. That's how it was. 
Anyhow, and he was 330, 350 pounds. Anyhow, we were brought into there, into um, Montreal, and and the main star there was Andre the Giant, and uh, the as the baby face, and Killer Quosk is the heel. Andre, we had worked with in New Zealand in the 60s, but Jimmy had worked against him in the promotion around the country. He was there for two months in New Zealand in the late 60s. And of course, Killer Kowalski, we were going over to work for Jim Barnett for World Championship Wrestling in Australia. And we met, we had met um, Killer Kowalski. He was the main heel there in Australia. So when we come to the States, the main heel, the United uh, North America, the male he main, main heel was Killer Kowalski and the main baby face was Andre the Giant. And this promotion was running three towns a night. The territory was on fire. <clears throat> After a year and a half working there, and we were working one of the, the, they were running three towns a night. One of the towns we were working semi-main or main every night you know, after we'd been there for about a month on television. And um, after a year and a half, they said, we know, well, you have to start doing the job for some of the guys now instead of us putting you over. So, he, but they said, you know, you, you know, having your back to the canvas ever with advertising on the soles of your boots. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, he said, we've got a territory you can go to, Stampede Wrestling. We never heard of it. We never heard of it. In, in Montreal, that office in Montreal, we were working two provinces. We were, we were working Ontario and um, Quebec. And then so they, they said, you know, we've got Stampede and it's in Alberta. So we head over and go to, go to um, fly over to um, Stampede, Calgary. They tell us where to book in and that was the hotel where all the boys stay. And we got in the night earlier. The next night was um, the, the television show, which was in the pavilion in the showgrounds in Calgary. Now there was two arenas in, in back now, so um yeah. Right. Yes. So these kids were thrown in the ring, and that there was there was four of them thrown in the ring. Two of them were bleeding, and that. So we, and the guy said, "Put the boot to them, champ, champs." And um, so we're putting the boot to these these four kids plus the two the two title holders. When they're all laying out, we just got. Uh, left left the ring and it was like a bloody mess there four people were bleeding and there's two other kids in that so we walked out walked back the, down the aisle and back into the dressing rooms so this is the first time we met Stu Hart what the f effing hell are you doing out there these are my those are my kids in the ring <laughs> and we said we, we said we were just told to put the boot to them and that boot to them you know who threw them in it was Abdullah the Butcher <laughs> oh, no. And we couldn't mention his name in the WWE um, Hall of Fame because Vince was, um, he was on the outs with WWE, you know what I mean? Because of the hepatitis and all that sort of stuff, yeah. scandal. So, um, anyhow, that was the first day. Anyhow, we didn't realize, but that weekend, th uh, that weekend was a double shot in Calgary, three times a year. Stu would run the the um the place where I just what I said what room did I call that now that was the um pavilion he'd run that and then he would run the corral on the Sunday now they shot the TV on Friday night which which we just did it was shown at ten o'clock on Saturday morning and it was everybody used to watch Stampede Wrestling and as kids. And his kids were well known on it too. So so Sunday we worked in the corral. And boy, when we came out to go to the ring, people were throwing stuff at us and screaming at us. We had heat already, not the drawing heat, but we had heat from the people who watched the television show. 
and that was our that was our first start and we won the belts that night in the corral and then that was our first start in stampede we we were actually the smallest heels in the territory the booker was archie goldie the mongolian stomper he was about 260 john quinn was about 325 abdullah was 350 360 all the heels were big there was a few undercard heels that, that were around the 230 mark 220 mark but that was it all the main stars were big but anyhow that was our start we won the belts and from there on uh, Archie left, the, 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 the um, booker left, and then we used to go up to Stu Hart's place on Sunday and work out the program for the week with Stu. So that was that. There we go, we're back. Um, so, Luke, one thing I did actually want to kind of go back to is you were talking before your time in, in, in Stampede about the, the brilliant Andre the Giant. Now, he's someone I'm a huge fan of, and I watched a documentary a couple of years ago, and it was really quite emotional to, to watch. I wanted to discuss... Uh, your relationship uh, with Andre and some of the memories that you have with him on the road and what he was like as a person. Yeah, well, uh, when we, when we got to Montreal, you know, in New Zealand, we were sort of um, it was kayfabe was a strong thing then. You know, we'd just see him in the back of the house in the dressing room or beforehand, and at the dressing room, of course, had two different um, exits to go to the ring. But we met him and, we, you know, we got to know him and that and a few bars. At the time, all the all the pubs closed at six o'clock. And, you know, the hotels, you know, we stayed in hotels with the bar, which they have the public bar downstairs and they have a private house bar upstairs. So we got to know him a little bit. But when we come to, you know, we got to know him as a good friend, a good friend, you know, because we were working with him every night. But when we got to um, Quebec, he sort of took us under his wing. Even though he was the he was the heel and that, uh, he was the baby face, you know he had a rest, favorite restaurant and in the Crescent Street in downtown Montreal. Crescent Street's where all the restaurants and bars are, and that and we used to now and again we used to meet him there and that and uh, of course we used to see him every night in the dressing room. So we became good friends. Little story, well way up the top of Quebec, uh, you know um, now it's. Getting near Alaska, way up the top, right? It's eight hours from Montreal Drive. And I forget the Yukon, I forget what territories we're in. And we're working on the road, you know, with Andre and a partner against me and Butch. <clears throat> on the way back, he had a manager called Frank, Frank Vauer, and he was a Frenchman too. Just like, I think Andre and him were from the same town in France. Anyhow, on the way back, <clears throat> we were in our car in Montreal driving back. I don't know who else was with us in the car. There were three of us. And then Andre and Frank were in another car. <laughs> when they left, they, they had got two, two um, packs, 60, uh, 12, 60, yeah, 12. So they, got, they had picked up 120 beers. Right, oh. 24 packs, I think, 48, six, 48, yeah, 60, yeah, or whatever. Two, they had 60, be 100, about 120 beers. About three hours or four hours down the line, we're halfway through the trip. Dad ran out of beer, and this was in the middle of the night, and it was in summer. We pulled over at a truck stop. And that I went in, and of course they sold beer, and they sold beer around that. And <clears throat> when we pulled in, they were um, we got out of the car, of course, and started walking into the into the store. And that, and these university students were they say 21, 22, 23, nine, you know, excuse me, age group started yelling at us. We had black. Uh, black beards and, and blonde hair, really blonde hair at the time. <coughs> me and Butch, <coughs> pardon me. Mm -hmm. And we had long hair, right? And these people yelling out, fags, tapette, tapette, that means fa fags in, um, in French. And that, so um, we went into the store and of course, 
there's a big store where the where where it had a restaurant, the big truck stops, and up in that way, the one side there was a restaurant where you could you know walk, sit around the bar, you know the bar stools and that where not not drinking bar, but a, a breakfast bar for the truckers, and that because a, a lot of truckers on the road there logging, and that and um. We went around there to get something to eat. These kids were calling us and that. So Andre got out. When he got out of the car, he heard all this and that. They hopped out of their Volkswagen and went into the store too. Andre, this is how he, he was only, it was 1972. This tells you how strong he was. He grabbed that Volkswagen and lifted it up and put it on its side. Wow. That was those old, old, old Beatles. You know, they're not built heavy like they are today. They were, they were looking at little tin things. You know what I mean? The old Beatles. Yeah. Uh, and that Andre was super strong, but that's when in his younger years. You know what I mean? This was seventy-two. You know, and and he died in ninety-three. So you can imagine uh, seventy-two, ninety-two, ninety-two. This is twenty, he's fifty. He's thirty now. Late twenties to thirty. You know what I mean? Yeah. He got it. Anyhow, they bought another lot of. They bought another 120 beers, and they and I heard they drank those before they got back to to, to Montreal. You know, a, a beer can. Andre would would have two mouthfuls. You know what I mean? And the can would be empty. Two or three mouthfuls. He was completely. He was something that no one's ever seen before. But he was yeah. like this. He was the only guy that Vince let drink in the dressing room. You know, in the end, his back was so bad. You know, he. Those days, they never had the injection like Big Show has. You know, Big Show's had those injections and that where they, where it prolongs the giantitis, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, but his um, joints for, were ever growing, you know what I mean? The cartilages in the, the joints were kept, were kept growing and that, and that gave him so much back pain and pain throughout his body. So he would, Vince let him drink a couple, he used to drink a couple of bottles of red wine while he was playing cards with Arnie Scotland in the dressing room before he went out to the ring. You know, a, a bottle of wine, he didn't phase him, you know what I mean? A couple of bottles of wine never phased him, but that helped him, I guess, and eased, eased the pain a bit. He, you know, if Andre loved you, you were right in his good box, but if he hated you and he, and he was in the ring with you, that big hand would chop you, boy. <laughs> that would knock you over. That hand would knock you over the top rope. You saw how big his hands were, yes. right? They're yeah, huge. Hey. Yeah, but man, he had a great heart. Beautiful man. A beautiful man. If you go online, you'll see his last interview. Last interview and last show with WWE was with Butcher Me against earthquake and tugboat in Madison Square Garden, the natural disasters. He was in our corner. He was on a walking stick because his leg, he had leg surgery. He had broken his leg or had knee replacement. I don't know. He'd, they'd done something with his leg anyhow. And it was in plaster and he had, was on a walking stick. And the interview's online. There's the, with the, Andre the Giant with the uh, Bushwhackers. I wanted to actually um, touch upon your you coming into WWE, WWF, because you were veterans, both of you, by that time. Um, so how did that actually come about, you getting into the WWF? And was it something that you always kind of worked towards? I actually started sitting tapes now, not VHS. Before VHS, it was Betamax. Be yeah. You ever heard of Betamax tapes? I have, yeah. Televisions used to use them back in the in the seventies and early eighty. I was actually sending Betamax um, videos of me and Butch to WWF when Vince Senior was alive. Okay. And that and that, and, and that was in 82, 83, You know what I mean? Vince Junior hadn't taken over yet. So it's and then, and then, and then it wasn't till you know I sort of slowed down setting stuff. Was I realized it was a big man's territory. Roddy Piper had already gone in for an interview. He was a good mate of ours. 
you know, he was the longest living um, guy that I'd known until he died. And he died three months after we went in the, the Hall of Fame. You know, Roddy had known from the mid, mid to late 70s. From, from Canada and, you know, in, and working with him. You know, I worked with Roddy and Rick Martell for a year and a half for South Northwest Championship Wrestling, you know, from the top of California into Vancouver, Canada. So in that, um, that so uh, where was I? Yeah, it was Andre, how did I get into Vince? Well, you know, well, sort of Roddy brought us into the States. We were in in Hawaii working for um, Steve Ricker, the New Zealand promoter who had bought um, who had bought Hawaii from from the promoter there before. And um, Roddy came in for a big show and uh, we said, we've got to get out of here. We were just keeping our heads above water, you know, flying to five islands a week, living the life on Waikiki Beach. <laughs> but, yeah, living the life, eating the food, living the life, going to the gym every day, leaving, leaving for a show at five o'clock every night and getting back at 10 o'clock. We hopped on a private charter every night, flew to another island, and then flew back to uh, Waikiki every night, and that's how it went. But we were just keeping our heads above the, yeah. above the water. So Roddy said, you know, Roddy, so we told him that, and he called the promoter up straight away, and next minute we were booked for Don Owens, Northwest Championship Wrestling. That's how we got the, got into the states, and then the second ter second major territory was, of course, the head office for NWA in Charlotte, North Carolina, where all the main superstars were. That was a bigger office than WWF at the time. You know, they did all over the South. They were on cable. Te uh, they were on um, satellite television, but the satellite wasn't so strong up north. It wasn't in so many packages, cable packages, as it was in the south. It was, you know, CNN. It was Ted Tuna's network. CNN, TBS, TNT, and you know, T, uh, T, TNT Sport. Anyhow, so anyhow, we was we were in the, we were working for the, that was our second territory down there working for them, and they had all the superstars who actually ended up in WWF when Vince Jr. took over. Anyhow, getting jumping from there to '88, we would been working all around the country for different promoters under the NWA banner. And then we come back to the head office in W in Charlotte, and that, and we just got back there, and we, and we shot an angle working with um, we're working with the Rock and Roll Express. And then we just shot something with Barry Windham and Alex Luger. They were called the Towers, or something Towers, and um, we're in the gym, and I can't remember what town it was. And the Butch always worked on his stomach after at the end of the workout. He always worked on his core. I was lazy. I never <laughs> worked that on my call much. I went and picked up and called my home phone from a box out telephone box outside. This was, there was no um no cell phones at the time. This was early '88. Picked up my message and there was a voice. There said, "This is Pat. Can you call me back, please?" I wrote down the number. And, and I called him back, and he says, this is Pat here, Pat, Pat Patterson here. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. Someone wants to talk to you. And then there was someone saying, the, the voices said, uh, G'day, mate. This is Vince McMahon. That was the end of the story. He said, I'd like you to come in there. He says, when you get a day off. Well, um, I says, uh, I think we have one day off, and that's next Wednesday. We'd, we'd get one or two days off a month. This the North uh, NWA Territory was running two shows a night, and then I think we got a day off. And then he says, when you get back home, there'll be tickets on your doorstep. I gave him my address, 
and there was tickets on my doorstep when I got home off the road, and we flew up to Connecticut that, that early that morning on Wednesday morning. A car was there to pick us up. Stanford is an hour away from Kennedy, and um, we met Vince McMahon. It's, uh, he said to us, he said to us, um, you know, I'd like to change you from, from the good guys, uh, from the bad guys to good guys. At the, at the time, we were known for blood and guts, you know. We, we were notorious for all the wild, you know, barbed wire cage matches. Uh, we'd have done fire matches. We'd done every sort of wild match, you know. You know, uh, every game, everything you could think of as a gimmick, we'd done as matches, whether it was blood and guts. And he says, I, I think you've had enough of that stuff. He says, I like to bring in the good guys. And that, and, um, of course, me being old fashioned, and I'd already been booker in a few territories. Up to WWF, I'd booked in two or three territories, you know. I'd booked for about six or seven years. And I said to him, why not bring me in and um, turn us? And he says, no, that's not what I do. And later on, I knew you don't tell Caesar what to what what to do. He tells you, <laughs> Caesar's Vince. Anyhow, um, so he says I'm going to bring you in, do vignettes. Well, Butch. Anyhow, when he said I want you as baby faces, Butch jumped up on the on his desk, leaned over his desk, and put his nose about a foot away from Vince. He says, if you can make these faces baby faces, go for it. And Vince looked back at him. He says. Look at the look at the heads on my uh, look at the mugs on my top baby faces. Hulk Hogan, Jake Roberts, um, Hacks or Jim Duggan. They're not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> get to laugh at that. You know what I mean? Well, they haven't got the prettiest mugs, have they? No, definitely, yeah, um, definitely not. So, uh, <laughs> definitely so not. We, <laughs> So he said, so he says, I'm going to bring you up for about three or four weeks and we're going to do vignettes on you. And, um, and then, and then we'll bring you into a live show. So we flew up and he had us doing all this crocodile D movies were hot at the moment. So that was a good time for us because we were doing all vignettes, you know, from down under the cars yeah. are on the road, you know, the cars drive on the other side of the road. They're um, right-hand drives, not like left-hand American. Um, we never seen um, Coke machines or, or any of those, you know, machines where they you put your dollars in and the things pop out. You know, we copied everything like you know, the guy did in Crocodile Dundee. We didn't copy what he was doing, but we did vignettes telling the same story, that we were two guys from down under first coming to North America, to USA. Now the fans didn't, when we first went to WWF, the fans never put it together. Here was two guys who were blood and guts and hard hardcore. We were known as the bloodiest, wildest uh, team, uh, tag team around, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, and then here, here we are doing semi-comedy stuff. People couldn't put it together. They didn't think it was us, you know what I mean? Then when we did have people that realized it was us, they said to us, but how could you change from being a, a, a heel and such a wild and blood and guts to being such a comical guy? And they, we said straight away, marketing, money. Once, yeah. once you go to WWF or WWE, which turned to WWE, you become, you become a, uh, um, you're out of the wrestling. You're out of the rest and you become a personality. You know what I mean? You come, you become a celebrity because he got you on all these other television shows, you know, late night shows, the sports, um, different, different kinds of shows on which had nothing to do with tele, with wrestling, but it got you marketed out throughout the world or throughout USA. So there you are. That's how we, we, we started. We did vignettes for a month. And then we went to the ring the first time. He said to us, we'd like you between the road dogs and the sheep herders, who we were, the sheep herders. Yeah. And the sheep herders have been on TBS or, you know, Turner Network Television on a satellite off and on for 10 years. And, and of course, 
the Moondogs had been on Butch on um, Vince's show for about five years or six years, and Butch said, well, they, we can't be either like them because everybody's seen them. And so he sort of come up and says, we always swung our arms when we went out the ring. You know, and we we go out the ring and then and swing our arms at the at the public and go whoa, yay, <laughs> to try and scare them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, so we, we we came up with well, he, he came up with marching to the ring, swinging our arms and and lifting our legs up high. You know, the bushwhacker walk. Yeah. And of Is course, the head small? licking and the head, <laughs> yep, and the head. And then the head licking came in too, which put us. <laughs> In another phase of what no one would do, you know what I mean? They go, eh. But of course, we would. We were two guys from down under, sardine eating, sardine eating um, maniacs. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, people, women would go, wouldn't want to go near us because they say, "Oh, your breath stinks of sardines." <laughs> Funny, funny thing, we hardly ever ate sardines. I, I ate sardines on toast. I loved them on toast. Anyhow, that. Was it? We are sardine eating. We did. We did even vignettes with eating raw sardines and in restaurants and throwing the cutlery away and eating with our hands. And we did all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, we butch to grab the knife and fork. We don't need these. Throw them over the shoulder and then we just go into the plate and start eating with our hands. And that's it. The vignettes and the people saw these vignettes and they were. They said, well, "These guys are crazy." And they started coming out and seeing us and we'd walk in we'd walk down the aisles of the arena and everyone would be doing this <laughs> even, even in the NFL when they scored in the end zone the guys would score the board and then they walk around the end zone doing this it was an instant hit did, did you um, for both of you obviously you were known as these kind of hardcore uh, full on guys in, in the stuff that you've done before but obviously coming into the WWE and like you said given this gimmick of, of comedy characters was that something you both kind of were uneasy about to start with when you were first told look this is what you're going to do were you kind of like you know I, I don't really like this or were you excited for the challenge he never told us what to do we put the whole gimmick together ourselves wow. <laughs> You know, with the the, the um the contracts that arrived at home, and Butch says, "Oh, they've sent the contracts to the wrong people," and I said, "No, they haven't. Vince wants to own us. He's changed us to the Bushwhackers because that was the down under name." No, okay. we were professionals, mate. We it was time for a change, and it was easier on us, of course. We did. There was no blood and guts every night, and um. And we, we adapted straight away. So it took us a couple of weeks going to the ring to get it right in stride and that. But we adapted and got right into it. And you guys had such a chemistry with the audience, which is it's not e always easy for wrestlers to have. But just anywhere you went, they just fell in love with you and they related to you. So for both of you going from heels for the majority of your career to actually be these, you know, much-loved faces. Did you actually enjoy that and the fact that you were so loved by the fans? Yes, yes. You know, I'm, I'm always, I'm a heel. My heart, I'm a heel. <laughs> As a heel, we could, and we're working with good, good baby faces, we could, butcher me, could get the people to stand up and sit down. As heels. We knew what to do and then let the baby faces come back and let the people stand up and start cheering. And then we'd cut the baby faces off and they'd sit down and be pissed off. We wouldn't let the baby faces come unglued till right at the end of the match. We knew how to control the people. So when we t now we're on the other side of the fence, we <laughs> turned it around. You understand? Yeah. So we'd done that all our life. We'd done that for the last 10 or 15 years of you know, we started tagging up together 66, 67. I worked as Sweet William at the start as a fag, you know, when I first started wrestling. A gorgeous talk, the gorgeous George gimmick. But after tagging and that, we were many, th many things. You know, in, in the southeast, I used to lead Butch around on a collar and chain. And in Montreal, it was Sweet William and the Brute. Butch was, Butch was always Brute Miller till we come to North America. America. The Brute was a big name all around the States and Canada that we had to, he changed to, he had to change his name, you know what I mean? Well, I did want to, uh, well, I mean, you could probably, 
imagine I'm going to bring this up, which is, of course, it's legendary even to this day, is your Royal Rumble uh, appearance, which was just brilliant. I mean, you, you come in marching into the ring, chucked over, and then march your way back out. When they came to you and said, this is what's happening, what were your initial thoughts? Because I believe that Butch was in there for a good 25 minutes working. I love, I love the idea. Butch, <laughs> Butch even brought that up in their Hall of Fame speech. He says, <laughs> he says we got paid the same bloody money. <laughs> I sweated my guts out there for 25 minutes and I marched in and out. You know, I've had so many promoters over the last, that was 91, I think. Yeah. I've had so many promoters bring me in for a Royal Rumble or, you know, a, a, a rumble and um, indep independent and that and ask me to do the same thing. <laughs> so legendary, that's why. It's, it's yeah, so that, 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 Yeah, that really, Butch, we laugh about it now, but at <laughs> the time, Butch is fuck. I didn't get any extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one. And, and mate, that, that actually kept me alive up to a year, a year ago. Every year for the Royal Rumble, he showed that clip. In the last year, uh, this year, he never showed it. I, I don't know whether he showed it in, 19, in 2019, but he'd sh been shown it every year up to 2018. Maybe 2019 he showed it. I can't remember, but this year he never showed it. So that, that kept me alive too, you know what I mean? And people use that clip many times on, on commercials and all that sort of stuff. Well, that's going to be one person I didn't want to actually quickly, it's something you mentioned uh, previously in the interview, was uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Now, for me, one of the greatest of all times. And I don't know if you watched the, the series on the network, Legends House, um, from a, a few years ago, and he, he was on that. And you got to see just what an incredible, funny uh, person that Roddy Piper was. He, he liked to have a prank. So what are your memories or, or funny stories that you, you've shared with Roddy Piper? Mate, if I started, if I started telling you the stories, um, no, I, you know, kids watch your show, and <laughs> adults watch your show. These are all, I can't tell you. I can tell you one. I, you know, every night it was something different. Every night there was little things, you know, I worked with him in, and when he called me up and, and got me into Northwest Championship Wrestling, we worked with him and Rick Martell, more or less six man, uh, tags, four man tags. We had Buddy Rose, Playboy Buddy Rose, uh, uh, and we brought him into the, um, the, into the Sheep Herder Army. He wore army gear with us. And we went into six man tags. They would bring in Andre the Giant. They would bring in Jesse Ventura. They would bring in someone else. Then we'd go back to tags. Then back to singles. You know, me against Rick Martel, me against Roddy, Butch, vice versa. We did that for a year, 14 months. I was in that territory maybe for 18 months. 14 months, we were married to these two. So you can imagine, what, you know, how much happened. Yeah. God bless them, you know. I don't know how far I can go with you. This, anyhow, now after we left, um, after we left um, Northwest Championship Wrestling, uh, we were booked down in Charlotte. The first person before us that left Northwest was Jimmy Snooker, and he was there as the World Championship with Ray Stevens. They were the World Championships. Butch and me come in. And we became the North, the um, Mid Atlantic uh, World Ch uh, Mid Atlantic Champions, and we were working around there. And about two months later, Roddy Piper came in, so we'd be travelling with Roddy Piper on the road. He was a heel lad with us. One night in South Carolina, South Carolina, th those days in the early eighties. This is nineteen eighty one. They were that was a real redneck area. You know what I mean? North was more uppity, South was more, you know, really redneck. You understand what I'm talking about? So, and and some of the towns, we had to do a television every Wednesday night in the towns, I can't even remember the name at the moment, but we were, it was a two-hour drive and we went through a lot of small towns on the way. 
So come, go and drive in there. You'd be doing 55, and then you'd have to go 45, 35, 25. And, and, you'd, and then all of a sudden you'd hit the town, and the town you'd go through was only 100 yards long. It would be one of those little pokey towns with about four stores and have a sheriff's department. And, um, you know, we'll be on a main drive. On the main drag, there would be, be a street of about a quarter of a mile with shops on either side. And that was that. You're through there and you're back out into the country. Well, we got caught one night leaving a town and we're in the country. And we started speeding up and we got out. A guy must have followed us for about 10 miles and then pulled us over. He said, I caught you on the clock radar going through this town. I think it, it went down to 25 miles an hour. And that, and uh, so we were about 25, 30 miles out when he pulled us over. And he says, "One of you, uh, you have to come back to the, the, you have to come back to the courthouse with me." And this was two in the morning. And he made he made the driver go in his car, so we had to follow him back to the courthouse. You understand? He had he put one in the back seat of his car, which which was the cage, of course. It was Roddy, and we drove we drove back to the um, corner. We go, drove back downtown to the police station. Courthouse was next door. Well, you won't believe this, but the judge, we went to arrived at the courthouse. He took us in. Next minute, a guy comes in with slippers on and a robe on, a dressing gown. They woke up the judge, <laughs> and, and, we, and we were in bloody court. <laughs> and that the speeding and all that and he finds and that usually if you have they find you if you can't pay up there they take your license off you you know not only they take your whole card off you you know your license so you have to go back to that courthouse to get your license you can't apply for another one because it's in it's in that you you know it's, you've it's been taken off you but if you come up with the money so we scraped, they found us, you know, Roddy, I think, 320, three something, and we scraped up the money between the three of us, and we paid the fine. So we left the courthouse, and the judge is still in the courthouse. The, the cop is gone now. The judge is still in the courthouse doing the paperwork. Now he's sitting at a desk, and about eight feet away from the desk, on the side of him, is a big window, and we could see him from his shoulders up outside and that butch and roddy come around and they pissed up on the window so if he turned around you see piss coming on the window from <laughs> the, and you see their hands they pissed on the window with the judge there i was freaking out and they they didn't give a damn because they've been drinking too drinking it after the show you're having a cold one on the always after the show you'd be drinking beer on the way back to the town i was never a beer drinker but uh you know, that was it yeah, that was one of the times of Ryder. He didn't give a damn. He was humorous. Back in the Northwest, you know, they were always joking with Buddy Rose. Buddy Rose had a van, and we all used to tra travel to the outskirts of the town with um, uh, the van was all covered in, so they never saw Rick Martell and Roddy Piper in the back of the van. But on, they would argue on the way and would stop the van, and then and all of a sudden we'd have to mark off 40, 40 yards for a sprint and they'd get out and Buddy would have to ra ra race against Roddy or Rick Martell just for a bet. Th these things were happening all the way. We'd yeah. mark it off and then I'd get back in the van and argue something else would come up. You know, there were fun, fun arguments who would get heated. I'm uh, crazy stuff, you know what I mean, all the time. I'm tempted to make this an 18 plus interview and just get some more funny stories. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a... Um, Mate, Roddy, there's a lot of stories about him. Yeah. God bless him. But I can't mention them, you know, I can't mention them now. Um, what I do want to uh, talk about is obviously the, the honour that you guys uh, had when you were asked to be in the WWE Hall of Fame. Now, I wanted to go back. Who actually made the, the phone call to you? And what was your reaction and feeling when you found out the news? A guy called Mark in the office who was, you know, he's, he's under. Under um, Hunter, 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 he does all the um, talent, 
organization. You know what I mean? Yeah. Contact talents and all that sort of stuff. Mark, I forget his last name, but uh, he made, he's well known anyhow. Uh, I'm, I'm looking it up for you. you. You'd see his name come up a lot. Because sometimes you Carano. see... Carano. Mark, Car Mark Carano. He, he contacts everybody for appearances. You heard of the name Mark Carano? Yeah. Yeah, he contacted us and told us, you know... We'd like to put you in the Hall of Fame. Of course, we were dying to get in for years and years. And that was it. We'd come up on that. And I remember the night of the Hall of Fame right before us. Um, a couple of other people had long, had made long speeches. And they were, they repeated themselves and repeated themselves. And um, Vince was not very happy what was going on in the Hall of Fame that night, you know what I mean? We had big stars, we had, <clears throat> that's when we had Arnold, Arnold Switzinger, Swastnecker, you know? And, uh, but that night, right before we was to go on, Vince said to us, make it short, sweet, and you can do anything, go as humorous as you like. So we'd, Butch and me had talked over a few stories and that beforehand, and that's when we went out and hit it. And um, we, we only did about, 10 minutes, 8 minutes talking, but the people, we had the people laughing all through it. Do you remember our Hall of Fame speech? I do, he actually licked your face. <laughs> oh, yeah, we held that off. He went to do it a couple of times, and we worked it and worked it, in the end I let him do it. And then you and had... We had uh, and we had, we had about three of the four stars come up doing the Bushwhackers walk, and Roddy was one of them, uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan was another, Ted DBS, he was another and of course Bret Hart you know Bret was one of those kids that was thrown in the ring he was only 13 then the first time I was in Calgary remember when I told you we had yeah. to kick the shit out of these kids I've known Bret since then since 1973 and I'd come back you know we came back to work for Stu and that in 1979 we had a month to fill in between Japan and going to Northwest Championship Wrestling when we worked with Piper Mantel and that. So we had a month and we went up there. And Dynamite Kid had just come into Calgary at the time. He was 175 wet, but muscular. And that, and um, when we were in the, when we were, when we left there before, we were the smallest heels in the dressing room. When we came back, we were the biggest for that month. We joined up with, we joined up with, um, Dynamite Kid, and we became the UK, we became the British Connection, because we, New Zealand is under the Queen too, and we worked, for that month we worked against three of the heart, with three of the heart kids, and twice we worked with two of the heart kids and Stu himself, in Calgary and in Edmonton, the two main towns, Stu was in the corner, he was a, in the six-man tag. So we can say that we worked with, we'd worked with um, Stu, uh, Stu Hart, and not many people had, and, you know, uh, you know, around that time or, or later on ever worked with Stu. We were, you know, back in the 70s, we worked with, and late 60s, we worked with some big names. We worked with Rock's, dad, Rock's grandfather a lot in New Zealand, and Butch went over to um, Samoa for the 10th anniversary, Independence anniversary, and worked with uh, High Chief Peter Marvia. The Rock's grandfather there, and I worked with him a lot in Australia and New Zealand. We worked with Killer Kowalski, we worked with Andre. This was in the 60s, you know what I mean? And then in the early 70s, we were working with Stu Hart. A lot of big names. Well, I wanted to actually go back to the, the Hall of Fame speech because what you were just saying about you, you brought Bret Hart up. And what I remember and I loved is I always know Bret Hart. He's quite a serious guy. But you actually had him walking up to the, the stage doing doing the Bushwhacker walk. And it was incredible because he was having a bit of fun and we got to see that side of, of Bret. You, you yeah, brought well, we, worked, we worked a few six-man tags, you know, in, in WWE... 
in the end, or you know, not not in the end, around 92, we worked six mans with him. When they fired Jim Anvil Neidhart, I think, uh, 92, 93. Yep. So uh, he'd marched in the ring with us there. That's brilliant. So we, you know, and Brett, Brett was a good friend. The Hart families, we'd known the kids, you know, Bruce, Brett, and of course the older one is dead now, Smith, and and no one we'd known all those kids for a long time, and had a lot of fun with them. They were they 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 were full of pranks. Rib, as you, as they're called today, the kids today wouldn't be able to take the ribs that they played. They played heavy ribs on talent. Wow. <laughs> Owen, Owen was his, his ribs were soft. They were great, but they were never they were never hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hard ribs. And um, going back to obviously going back uh, accepting your your Hall of Fame award. Was it kind of a surreal moment being back? Because obviously a lot of years have passed and the WWE has changed massively. So what was it like for you both being back? Did you have a lot of the new talent coming up to you and saying, look, we used to watch you as kids, you know, we love you. What was it oh, like? The new talent, mate, the new talent, um, today the new talent don't even know who we are. The kids today, there's only a few wrestling fans. They take them out of schools and athletic, you know, uh, sports and all that sort of stuff. Vince, that you know, the school, uh, the school is full of people that didn't even have a background in wrestling. There's only a handful that have been uh, who 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 are wrestling. There's who've been wrestling fans and wrestlers, you know, who've been independent wrestlers. The newest. Wow. You know, you go in now and that, you know, when Roddy went back to do things and that, and, and, and Paul Landoff went, here, here the guys who were at the start, it made wrestling what it was. And that they didn't even know who Mr. T was or who Roddy Piper was. A lot of the kids were there that, uh, that's, you know, who are these guys? You know, to them were, to them were old fogies. That surprises me because you, you sometimes see on documentaries when they do have reunions that a lot of the, the new talent kind of, they're in the hallway with, with certain people and they, they seem to really get on and kind of look up to them. So I'm surprised. Well, that on. well after they're told, after they're told, ah. they do. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, of course. Originally, originally they, they don't. Yeah, but some of them, you know, like a lot of them, that have come from ROH and that, you know, my friend who used to own ROH, Kerry Silken, before it was sold to the television network, you know, I used to go up there and and work on some of their shows and of course be around the boys and talk to them. So I knew a lot of the ROH guys that are in WWE now, the main guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the guys before. So I got it. Well, the, the main question now is, what are your thoughts on the wrestling industry as it is today? Um, we've obviously got a lot more opportunity. We've got AEW that's doing really well, which is a, a, a great product. Um, so, what are you, what are your thoughts in general uh, on the wrestling business as it is today? I, I think an opposition always brings a lot of people back into watching the television, especially when they get on and they start challenging each other. They'll never get to book, They'll never get to WWFs. Um, stage, you know, uh, up the ladder, they'll never get it as high as WWE are around the ladder, up the ladder as WWE is in every country of the world. AEW is a new thing, and of course, a new thing comes out, everybody goes to watch it, you yeah. know, to see, where, see what they're doing. But the fans, and of course, it's a lot of the WWE guys there. You know, they've got some great talent there. Dean Ambrose, Jerry, uh, uh, Moxley, uh, Chris Jericho, you know, and you know, and now they've got some, they've got Art Anderson and Tully Blanchard, and now they've got Jake and the, you know, as managers, yeah. and people back there who are great on interviews. Jake was one of the best, you know what I mean? Yeah, so they've got, they're doing things, it's, it's interesting, it's made, I know Vince doesn't like opposition. In the end, he usually buys them out. 
but for the people out there, and it creates interest too in the independent business. Wrestling gets back on the uh, back on the mainstream. You know what I mean? Helps it get. You know where the ratings go down at the moment. It's sad because the ratings. You know the shows are not live. You know they well they're live. They're live to the to um the viewers, but they're not in an arena with fans with the atmosphere. You know to give you the adrenaline. When you've got atmosphere there, it gives you the adrenaline. And talking about competition, um, Vince McMahon not liking it, one of the biggest uh, kind of ratings war was, of course, WCW uh, and WWF. Now, they were attracting huge talent, Hulk Hogan, uh, Randy Savage. Were there ever conversations between the Bushwhackers and WCW about you guys going over? Eric, you know, we went, we, after the WWF, we went and met with Eric and um, sat down with him and, you know, it's a funny thing, when we went to see him in the arena that night, we went and saw him in, a, in his office, but we looked in the arena, half the guys, did, there was about 20 guys on on um, on payroll that I knew for, for XWWE that were, weren't even seen in the ring in WCW, but they're on payroll. Wow. <laughs> We couldn't believe it. Anyhow, we had the meeting with Eric. He says, I'll let you know. And he sent someone, he sent a message back from somebody who says, we were too gimmicky. We, can you believe that? We were too gimmicky. I felt like saying, when you were running, for, uh, being an Eric, when, uh, when you were an office boy and getting coffee and carrying Hulk's bags around in 1972, um, in, in 1972 or 82, for in Minneapolis, we were selling out arenas. We'd been selling out arenas around the world from from the seventies. You know, mid yeah. You know, from seventy two onwards, we were working and selling even in, in sixty nine up in Singapore and that with Sweet William and, and the Brute. You know, we weren't the main. We were we were on the cards and selling out arenas there. But uh, in the in the seventies, we uh, got to the top in different. places places and towns when we're selling out towns and Eric said uh, he, we were heels I don't know whether he ever knew that we were sheep herders I don't know and but he said we were too gimmicky so that was our that was our um that was the end of WCW and what we said he asked us what we wanted in payroll and we gave him a price which I found out was a hundred thousand less than all the people sitting in the stands Wow. Okay. So you know, could, they, they had a great they had a great run there with ratings for for eighty weeks above WWE, but it was all WWE's talent that were you know WWF's talent, which was causing it, and um, the money they were spending every month to run the company. Vince was spending about a third or a quarter to run WWE, so he wasn't you know his business was down. But nothing, losing nothing like um, um, WCW was. I heard that we're losing hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions a year with all the big contracts they had. You know, talent, a lot of talent was on three million a year back in the um, in the nineteens, in nineteen ninety five, ninety six. A lot of talent was on three and two million then. That's crazy money. And and the problem is with WCW, it didn't seem to have the ability to create their own stars, minus a, a couple, you know, Goldberg. But in general, um, they, they kind of, you, you said they had WWE talent coming in that were getting those ratings. So I guess for, for the Bushwhackers going over there, maybe they didn't think they could do something new with you because they didn't have that creativity that WWE had. But we could have gone back to the, the we could, yeah. that was in the South. We could have gone back to the sheep herders who were in the South for 10 years, you know, on on, on, t on the same television. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, do you, for you guys, is that a regret? Do you wish you had gone to WCW? Or looking back, are you glad that you, you didn't go over because it, you know, fastly went downhill in the later 90s? Yep. Yeah. We just we we just went independent then, and that was it. You know, we were we were, were weekend warriors, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, for different 
were independent people and we were booked book fully all the time. And do you still do stuff now yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm still doing stuff. I'm still doing um, wrestle cons, uh, comic cons, and hopping in the. I'm, even at this age I am now, I'm still hopping in the ring. And do you reckon we'll get to see you in the UK? Is that something that would interest you? Come well, I'm wanting to be in the UK. I had few, I had a few bookings last year and that, but I'd already been booked in the States ahead of time. So I'm looking forward. This year, I was looking forward to getting over there early this year. But look, since this um, coronavirus, yeah. <laughs> everything is... Everything is shut down, put on hold. And a lot of things that have been put on hold will never eventuate because times of this is going to change the world, what's happened. Well, I've, I've got to say a massive thank you for you for, for giving us your time today because for me as a, as a huge wrestling fan, to actually get to listen to your career stories and the fact that you've worked with pretty much everyone and listening to you today has just made me kind of realize how special hey, I is. like talking to you I like talking to all your fans out there and whoever listens around the world because uh, back in Britain back in UK we were really independently I worked for um, Brian Dixon off and on for about three years you know and I, sometimes I spent six months a year one month over there, one month back to the States, and we sold out everywhere independently. I was working six to seven nights a week for Brian Dixon every tour. This was in, in, in um, 2000, 2001 or 1999. All star. Yeah, and uh, I, loved, I loved working for him, and that even though. <laughs> he was he was very tight not to get the money out of me paid us all right but every time he tried to cut us down and that but we never we never got cut down in the bookings in our money and that and the, and we, we and we sold out continuously for him well i've got to say i really hope we get to see you at, um in the uk comic-con because the uk wrestling is huge at the moment we we've got a lot of conventions yeah. on that i, I hear it too so I just want to tell everybody my Facebook, my Twitter, and my Instagram page is Bushwhacker Luke. And my website is bushwhackerluke.com.com.org. Okay. You can call, you know, on Facebook Messenger, you can contact me for any bookings over in UK. I look forward to coming over there. And I'm still hopping in the ring. And I'm not lazy. <laughs> I still get up and march around like I did. I don't bum as much as I did, but I march around and entertain a good for twenty minutes. Luke. Good Thank talking you so to much you guys. You. And this is Bushwhacker Luke saying, "I'm out." Whoa. <laughs>